Hi everyone, today I thought we'll do just a brief overview of chapter 22, the respiratory system. As you all know, all cells in the human body need ATP to fuel their activities. The preferred pathway for ATP formation is aerobic glycolysis, but for aerobic glycolysis we require a constant supply of molecular oxygen and carbohydrates. Oxygen and glucose metabolism will ultimately yield water and CO2, a process that we call internal respiration. The CO2 byproduct will ultimately dissolve in water to form carbonic acid, which must be continuously expelled from the body. The task for supplying the cells with oxygen and glucose falls on the cardiovascular system, actually, as does the task of removing the waste products such as CO2. Oxygen, as we all know, is available from the atmosphere and will readily enter the circulation if blood is brought into close proximity. CO2 is also a gas that can be discharged into the atmosphere at the same time oxygen is being taken up. Hence, the primary function of the lungs is to facilitate the exchange of these glasses between blood and the atmosphere. That is the process known as external respiration. The lungs contain a respiratory epithelium that creates a large blood gas interface. It turns out that the total surface area of this interface is approximately 80 square meters, or roughly half the size of a single tennis court. The interface is extremely thin to facilitate rapid gas exchange between blood and the inspired air. These features together ensure that oxygen and carbon dioxide rapidly diffuse and equilibrate across the interface as the blood circulates through the pulmonary vasculature. Air is pumped in and out of the lungs through the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the respiratory muscles, most important of which is the diaphragm. The air pump flushes CO2 out of the lung and replenishes oxygen, ensuring that the gradients that drive the diffusion of both gases between the blood and the atmosphere remains optimal. Let's look now at the anatomy of the respiratory tract. So in order to create a blood gas interface within the thorax with a surface area sufficient to meet the demands of internal respiration, we require an elaborate system of branching tubes, which we call the airways, and the air sacs, as shown in this figure. The airways channel the air from the external atmosphere to the blood gas interface. The airways begins with the trachea, which is generation zero, which you see right on top of that figure, and then branches repeatedly to form the bronchial tree, which is this entire diagram. The tree contains approximately 23 orders of branching or branch generation and comprises of two functionally distinct zones, a conducting zones and a respiratory zone. The conducting zone, in the conducting zones, the airways do not participate in gas exchange. They simply channel the air. The larger airways, generation 0 to 6, 10 approximately, are supported structurally with cartilage to help maintain patency or openness. Generations 10 to 16 are called bronchioles with the terminal bronchioles, generation 16, demarcating the end of the conducting zone. The conducting zone in turn is lined with mucus secreting ciliated epithelium, that is the pseudostratified ciliated columna epithelia that we saw in chapter 4. The cilia beat constantly sweeping the mucus and the trap particulates up and out of the lungs. We call that the mucociliary escalator. It turns out that act tobacco smoke actually impairs the respiratory cilia function. Ciliary arrest, as is known, will then allow bacteria and other inhaled particulates to accumulate in the lungs, causing local irritation and epithelial inflammation. Hence, smokers are prone to coughing episodes and bronchitis as a result. Typically, ciliary function is restored with cessation of smoking. Let's look at the respiratory zone, which is generation 17 to 23 in terms of the branching of the bronchial tree that you see on this slide. Generation 17 to 23 comprises of the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveolar sacs, and is characterized by a tremendous amplification of the cross-sectional areas, which is shown on the next slide. So as you can see over here, we have tremendous amplification of the cross-sectional area, 
even as the passages narrow. The respiratory zone is the location of the blood gas interface. Finally, if you just go back to the slide and look at the alveoli, the alveoli are the thin walled polyhedral sacs with internal diameters of approximately 75 to 300 micrometers. So that's what an alveoli is. The lungs contains approximately 300 million alveoli that are interconnected via, via pores of cone, as they are known. The alveolar lining separates the atmospheric air from the vasculature. In compri it comprises of two respiratory epithelial cells, or pneumocytes. The type 1 pneumocytes are thin and flat, and they're over here, you can see that. And they make up the bulk of the alveolar surface areas, approximately 90%. The type 2 pneumocytes, shown over here, or the granular pneumocytes are present in equal numbers but are more compact and therefore occupy less area. They are filled with numerous lamella inclusion bodies that contain pulmonary surfactants. Type 2 cells are in fact capable of rapid division and which allows them to repair any damage to the alveolar wall. Type 2 cells can also subsequently transform into type 1 cells which in fact divide rather Rarely. Let's now look at the blood gas interface. The pulmonary capillaries meander between the adjacent alveolar sacs that you can see. This is a cross section, but you can see it in this diagram. You can see the capillaries in between the alveolar uh, space. So here's the capillaries. That's a cross section of one capillary, another third capillary. And these are the alveoli, the cross sections of which, once again, type 1 cells, type 2 cells. These little red discs naturally represent the red blood cells. So the density of these pulmonary capillaries is so great that they can create a near continuous sheet of blood that covers the alveolar surfaces. The distance that separates the red blood cells from the atmospheric air approximates the width of the capillary endothelial cell, which is here. plus the pneumocytes, which is here, typically the type 1, since they are most numerous and make up 90% of the surface area. So that's really the width of the blood gas interface. And we'll talk more about that in total. It's, a, it's approximately 0 0.3 micrometers or 300 nanometers, right? So 0 0.3 micrometers or so. Before we talk about the blood supply, let's talk about the role of surfactants. Surfactants' importance in pulmonary function cannot be overstated. There are three main functions, that is to stabilize the alveolar size and to keep the lungs dry. So uh, surfactants, the, as you know, the alveoli are lined with fluid and surfactants will help to break up the high surface tension of water, thereby preventing the collapse of the alveoli. And that's very, very important. You need to be able to keep the alveoli patterned open. Otherwise, you're not going to get the exchange of the gases. You're not, not going to get proper diffusion over there. Now let's look at the pleura. The pleurae are thin, serous membranes that cover the lungs. Similar membranes cover the heart, which is known as a pericardium, and the viscera, in the abdominal cavity, for example, which is known as a peritoneum. The pulmonary pleurae have two essential air pump functions to create a hermetic seal and to secrete pleural fluid. Let's look at the seal that's created first. The lungs themselves are lined by the visceral pleura that is shown in this red over here. Each lung is enclosed within its own pleural cavity and there is no connection between the two. So each lung is lined by its own visceral pleura and there is no communication between the two. On the other hand, the chest wall, the diaphragm, and the mediastinum, so around the heart, which is really not well shown over here, are covered with the parietal pleura. So the parietal pleura is shown in green, whereas the visceral pleura is shown in red. So that's the parietal pleura. That's a visceral pleura. The visceral and parietal pleura are 
physically attached to their respective underlying structures but not to each other, and the two membranes are separated by the interpleural space. Right? So this is the interpleural space between the parietal pleura in green and the visceral pleura in red. And that space shown in this diagram is actually exaggerated. It's much smaller. So this diagram is not drawn to scale. The pleura effectively excludes air from the interpleural space to hermetic hermetically seal the lungs to the diaphragm and the rib cage. Let's look at the role of the pleural fluid. The parietal pleura is innervated and vascular. It is and it is also believed to be the source of the viscopleural fluid that is secreted into the interpleural space. The pleural fluid has two important functions, lubrication and cohesion. The pleural fluid lubricates the pleural surfaces and thereby allows the lungs to slide freely over the chest wall and the diaphragm during normal breathing movements. The pleural fluid in terms of aiding inspiration is also very important because it is constantly secreted and absorbed. The volume contained within the interpleural space at any one time is approximately 10 milliliters, but it spreads to create a thin flim that covers all the surfaces, making the two pleura almost inseparable under physiological conditions. The same cohesive force that makes two glass microscope slides difficult to separate when a drop of water is caught between them applies over here. Cohesion allows the forces generated by the movement of the chest wall and the diaphragm to be transferred directly to the lung's surface. In other words, when the thorax expands, the lungs are brought along for the ride because the thorax is attached to the, the wall of the thoracic cavity is attached to the parietal pleura, and then the parietal pleura in turn is more or less suctioned to the visceral pleura because of this presence of the pleural fluid. And we'll also see a bit later on due to the slight negative pressure within the interpleural cavity. So because the parietal pleura is stuck to the thoracic cavity, when the thoracic cavity moves, expands, the visceral pleura is also now attached due to the high surface tension of the pleural fluid to the parietal pleura and as the thoracic cavity expands the visceral pleura is brought along pulled along so to speak for the ride and the lungs have to expand automatically so that's a really a passive process as long as the thoracic cavity enlarges in size then the lungs have no choice but to expand as well So this diagram also shows the similar functions as to what we were talking about over here. So as the thoracic, this abnormal atmospheric pressure, there's no difference between the pressure in the lungs, which is the intrapulmonary pressure, and the external atmosphere. So they are both at the same temperature. It's, that's what's shown over here. They're both at the same temperature, so there's no pressure gradient between the two. However, this in terms of the pressure in the pleural cavity, it is negative or less than the pressure in the lungs and the atmosphere. So that's why you see this relative negative number over here. It has approximately a negative 5 millimeters of mercury less um, than, in this case, it's given as centimeters of water, but really millimeters of mercury is the most standard unit of measurement. Over here. So these diagrams, incidentally, are taken from this book, Physiolo Physiology, by Preston and Wilson over here. So anyways, getting back to that, the interpleural cavity has a negative pressure relative to the intrapulmonary cavity. So hence, the interpleural pressure has, applies a light, like a suction force on the lungs as well. So this is also what enables the lungs to stay inflated. As, long, as soon as air enters into the, as shown in diagram B over here, as soon as air enters into the pleural cavity, now the lungs will automatically collapse over there because it is the negative pressure in the interpleural space that actually holds the lungs in the expanded position. In terms of movement of the lungs, it's very important to understand the role of the 
pleural fluid and the fact that the visceral and, and parietal pleura are more or less stuck together and the visceral pleura being stuck to the lungs in turn will pull the lungs along. But in terms of what makes the lungs uh, re remain open, that's the negative pressure. So the negative pressure, relative negative pressure in the interpleural cavity enables the lungs to stay open because of that suction effect over there. It's literally like having a vacuum stuck onto the lungs which pulls them further apart and keeps them open, filled with air. As soon as that negative pressure is dissipated by air entering into the pleural cavities, you will have lung collapse as shown over here. So that's the lungs that have been collapsed because you have air entering into the interpleural cavity. That's called atelectasis. Right? So here's a x-ray which you don't need to be able to read, but here's the lungs over here. They've literally collapsed. This left lung is fully inflated, the right lung has collapsed over here. The remaining space, which is dark, is, is air, but this is air in the interpleural cavity, not air in the lung itself. Right? So that shows you the lung collapse or atelectasis due to the fact that you have punctured the hermetically sealed pleural cavity, air has been allowed into the pleural cavity. Now, since the you no longer have a negative pressure inside the interpleural cavity, the lungs will automatically collapse because it, there's no suction pressure, so to speak, on it. Moving along, let's look at lung volumes and in, uh, lung capacities over here. So this diagram is very important. You'll likely see it on the test. And we did this spirometry example in the lab. So you need to be able to explain what the tidal volume is. You need to be able to explain what the inspiratory reserve volume is, what the expiratory reserve volume is, and hence also what the vital capacity is over there. So that's what we did in the lab and you should be able to explain it to some detail over there. But let's look at it in some uh, detail as well. So tidal volume is the regular amount of air that enters into the lung during each normal breath. Right, So that's tidal volume. On the other hand, inspiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that you can inhale above a normal breath and the expiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that you can exhale more than your a normal exhalation in a normal breath over there, right? So once again, let's do that. You need to know tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume. Where's my little cursor over here? Tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and vital capacity over there, right? And finally, maybe just the residual volume as well over here. So the residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lung after a maximal expiration and it works out to approximately 1.2 liters. As we saw in the lab, the tidal volume is approximately half a liter or so. Let's look at those are lung volumes now. Let's look at capacities. The sum of all the four lung volumes, and that would be inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume, the sum of all four volumes equals to the total lung capacity which approximates to approximately 6 liter in a normal individual. Vital capacity, as you can see over here, is the sum, here's vital capacity, this is the sum of tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume, and is really, if you want to think about it, it is really the maximal tidal volume achievable, which is the maximum or biggest breath that one can take. What is typically used and not shown over here is this term known as forced vital capacity or FVC, which is the volume of air that can be forcibly expired after maximal inspiration. And that's really what we uh, measured in the lab, right? So you remember we took a deep breath in and then expired as hard as we could. So really it's from here deep breath in all the way here. So VC is really equivalent to FVC. So vital capacity is really, in this case, in this diagram, equivalent to force vital capacity. And finally, there's one more term, not shown also here, 
false expiratory volume, or FEV1, which is the volume of air that can be forcibly expired in one second following a maximal inspiration. And that is probably the most important clinical measure of lung function. But we won't really be talking about that in more detail right now over there. Okay, so in summary, before we get to this slide, in terms of the anatomy, the lungs facilitate a exchange of oxygen and CO2 between blood and the air, and we'll look at this in more detail shortly. The blood gas interface is located within the alveoli, which are the thin wall sacs that serves to amplify the surface area and to bring the pulmonary circulation into close proximity to the inhaled air. The alveoli in turn are moistened by a thin fluid film that generates surface tension. This surface tension is a force that favors lung collapse and negatively impacts lung performance. So in order to dissipate that surface tension, the alveolar epithelium produces surfactant to counter the surface tension. Surfactant is a phospholipid complex that helps to stabilize the alveolar size and increases lung compliance, which is the amount of pressure you need to inflate the lungs. Breathing, as you know, involves a repeated cycle of inspiration and expiration. Air is drawn into the lungs by contracting the diaphragm and, and in some cases, the other respiratory muscles. But the most important is the diaphragm. Contraction increases the volume of the thoracic cavities and because the lungs are attached to the, more or less, attached to the thoracic cavity through the pleura, the lungs are forced to expand as well. The diaphragm, the chest wall, and the lungs move as one unit. They are linked, as we just mentioned, by the thin film of pleural fluid, which lubricates the visceral and parietal flu pleura and provides the cohesive force required to expand the lungs. At rest, the lung is subject to two opposing forces, surface tension and the elastic elements in the lung tissue favor the collapse because that's the elastic recoil nature of the lungs. The elastic elements in the chest wall, on the other hand, favor expansion and thereby prevent collapse. So those are the two competing forces over there. And it is also the lungs are also held open due to the negative pressure in the interpleural space. Introducing air between the two pleura, which is known as pneumothorax, breaks the connection between the lungs and the chest wall. That's the negative pressure that we were talking about, acts as a suctioning force. And once you break the connection between the lungs and the chest wall, now the lungs will automatically collapse over there. So we'll also look at the airflow between the alveoli and the external atmosphere, but that is diff driven by pressure gradients over there. And finally, we looked at the air movement between the lungs and the atmospheres, which we measured using spirometry. And spirometry is used actually to assess, as you know, lung health. The pulmonary function tests, so spirometry, we can, from those tests, we can derive four lung volumes, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume, and you should know that from the previous diagram. And from that volumes, we can get capacity, the total lung capacity, the f and the vital capacity. Finally, if we just go back, if I can mention this, go back to the initial uh, diagram on the branching of the airways and we looked at the conducting zone and the respiratory zone, the air that is actually enclosed in the conducting zones, so in other words within the regions of the lung that do not participate in gas exchange, all that is known as the dead space over there. Now let's look at gas exchange. So you know that the lungs facilitate the exchange of oxygen and CO2 between the blood and the air. Oxygen is required to fuel ATP production by the cell where CO2 is formed as a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. The lungs facilitate the exchange of O2 and CO2 by bringing blood into close proximity to the atmospheric air at the blood gas interface. When the diaphragm and the other inspiratory muscles contract, the lungs inflate. Air flows into the lungs, thereby replenishing oxygen at the blood gas interface and sustaining the steep oxygen and carbon dioxide pressure gradients required for optimal, optimal gas exchange. These, this exchange occurs rapidly and is enhanced by the thin divide between the blood and the air, and by the large in, interface surface areas. 
The efficiency of this exchange is also crit critically dependent upon the pulmonary circulation which brings CO2 to the lungs for disposal and carries away the oxygen. Physiological and pathological changes in either ventilation or perfusion of the blood gas interface can negatively impact lung performance, right? So this is what we're talking about. How? So let's look at the um, partial pressure gradients as well over there, right? So this is just looking at the blood pressure, really. As we know, blood pressure, the systolic pressure is 120 in the systemic circulation shown in red because it's oxygenated. And in the pulmonary circulation, blood pressure is much lower, only about 20 millimeters of mercury. We'll learn more about this when we do a 2 when we learn all about blood pressure over there. However, now let's look at partial pressures and how gases uh, diffuse. As we know, gases move between the air and the blood by passive diffusion. This is not a process requiring energy. If it did, we would be, instead of ingesting 2,000 calories, we'd be ingesting 20,000 or even more than that, right? So this is purely passive process, passive diffusion or simple diffusion. The basic principles governing gas diffusions are similar to those described for the solid diffusions that we saw previously between two fluid-filled chambers. However, there's one complicating issue, and in that case, we need to deal with how soluble a gas is in blood. If the gas is water insoluble, then it cannot enter the circulation ex except under extreme non-physiological circumstances. So in practice, this means that we will be discussing forces that drive oxygen and CO2 diffusion between the blood and the air in terms of the partial pressure gradients rather than the concentration gradients. So as you know, here's the alveolus. So if a gas is in high pressure over here, high partial pressure, it will diffuse from the alveolus into blood over here. So that's the alveolus. This is the pulmonary vasculature. It will diffuse down its concentration gradient. That's just simple diffusion. But in order to enter the into blood, that gas must be water soluble. Fortunately, both oxygen and carbon dioxide are water soluble. They're soluble in plasma. And hence, we don't, um, that's okay. So we don't need to deal with extreme non-physiological conditions. It turns out that our carbon dioxide is more soluble in water, which makes up the bulk of plasma, compared to oxygen. Hence, for oxygen, you can transport most of your oxygen that's dissolved in plasma or in blood because that's just not going to work. There's not going to be enough oxygen dissolved in the plasma. So what we need to do is to have oxygen uh, transported more or less in a different fashion. As you know, oxygen will diffuse from the plasma into the red blood cells where it will bind to hemoglobin over there. Let's first look at the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide before we describe how they really diffuse. So the term partial pressure recognizes that atmospheric air is a mixture of several gases. The total pressure exerted by a gas is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of each individual component, which is known as the Dalton Law, that you really don't need to describe. Anyways, atmospheric air composition is 78.09% nitrogen gas, so N2, 20.95% oxygen, O2, and 0.93% argon. Argon is an inert gas, we ignore it. And the remaining 0.03% is the carbon dioxide concentration. And then we have trace amounts of various other inert gases and pollutants, which we will also ignore. The fractional component and composition does not change with the height above sea level or with temperature, so it's more or less fixed, right? And that's just the approximate. What about the inspired air composition? The air composition does not change during inspiration because Sorry, the air composition does change, it really does, we know that, during inspiration because the mucous membranes lining the nose and the mouth add water vapor. And that's the key thing over here. So by the time the air reaches the alveoli, it is saturated with approximately 6.18% water. Now, that in turn will affect the fractional composition of the other gases, and hence they are reduced correspondingly to approximately 73.26% nitrogen, 19.65% oxygen, 
and 0.87% argon. Right? So you don't need to memorize these figures by any stretch. All you need to know is that for inspired air, it's approximately 73% nitrogen, approximately 19.5% oxygen, 0.9% argon, and 0.03% CO2, reduced because of the addition of water vapor over there. So and let's look now look at the partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 specifically. So if you look at the external air, the partial pressures of oxygen is 160, which is really just taking the percentage composition of oxygen, dividing it by 760. And that will give you millimeters of mercury because that's the pressure of air at atmospheric pressure. So and then multiply by 100. So approximately 20 over 760 you see works out to approximately 160 millimeters of mercury and you do the same thing for the others if you go now to the conducting airways during inhalation you can see the partial pressure of oxygen has decreased and that's because we've added water vapor we're not going to look at water vapor over here because it doesn't play a role in the transport of the gases in the alveoli, we'll see it decreases further still, and we'll get to why that's the case. Actually, we might as well do it over now. So remember, in the conducting zone is the dead space. There's no um, exchange of gases over there. So during each breath, for example, when we exhale, there's some air trapped in the conducting zone, which doesn't exit from the mouth itself, right? And then when we take the next breath in, so during inhalation, the air that was trapped in the conducting zone goes back into the alveoli. And that cycle is repeated over and over again. So what really happens is we get incomplete replenishment of the air. So it's not that all the air in the lung is expelled and then all new air is brought into the lungs. No, that does, doesn't work because first of all, we have the residual volume in the lungs, remember? And then we also have the air that is trapped in the dead space. So for that reason, we get mixing of both stale air, if you like, and the fresh air that we're inhaling. And as a result, the stale air, as we know, has less oxygen. The fresh air has more oxygen. We're not going to get, in the alveoli, we're not going to get 160 millimeters of mercury of oxygen because that would imply all of the fresh air entering into the alveoli. That's not true there's always going to be some residual air in the alveoli that's the residual volume in the lung and the air in the dead space in the conducting zone being brought back into the lung so you're going to get mix mixing and as a result the po2 for oxygen is now reduced to 100 and we'll talk about why in the pulmonary cap capillaries it is also 100 and thereby in the systemic arteries it's slightly below 100 and then once it gets to the pulmonary arteries so this is air the blood being brought back to the lungs it's now 40 whereas in terms of co2 it's more or less constant except in the pulmonary arteries just the blood being brought back to the lungs it's 45 so it's 40 in the alveoli because you have air that is trapped over there it's 40 everywhere else except in the pulmonary arteries this is a venous circulation that is bringing the blood back to the lungs over there so let's look at this in more detail over there so Air, in terms of oxygen, on the external atmosphere, we have 160 millimeters of mercury of air. It goes into the alveoli where it's approximately 100, and that's because of the mixing of stale air, fresh air. Now, air, oxygen will diffuse down its concentration gradient. So it will continue diffusing until the air in the pulmonary veins has the same concentration or partial pressure as the air in the alveolus, assuming everything else is normal and it indeed that will occur so the air the partial pressure of the blood in the pulmonary veins this is the arterial blood now uh, oxygenated uh, blood now it will be a hundred millimeters of mercury right so that's going to be exactly the same it has to be exactly the same be otherwise blood air and oxygen will continue diffusing until it is exactly the same because remember Gases will continuously diffuse until their partial pressure gradients are the same, until their concentration gradients are the same for gases we use partial pressure. So if this is 100 for oxygen millimeters of mercury, it has to be 100 in the plasma, in the pulmonary veins as well. Similarly, if it is 40 millimeters of mercury in the pulmonary arteries, uh, 
it has to be 40 millimeters of mercury in the alveolus. If it were lower in the alveolus, small CO2 would diffuse from the pulmonary arteries into the alveolus. So it will continuously diffuse until it is exactly the same. So it's going to be 40 for carbon dioxide and approximately 100 for oxygen in terms of millimeters of mercury. So that might be surprising because it is not all the CO2 is expelled. We always have some CO2 remaining in our blood because CO2 ultimately is what determines the blood pH levels to some extent, to a very important extent. And CO2 is also what drives respiration. So if our CO2 levels actually drop, we're going to slow down our breathing rate to, in order to retain more CO2. And if our CO2 levels rise, we're going to start hyperventilating in order to exhale out more CO2, excrete out more CO2. So in the pulmonary veins, initially at least, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be 100. But in the arterial circulation, after the blood has been pumped out through the heart, it is not 100, it's slightly below 100 because of this venous admixture. So you get shunting of blood from the venous circulation to the oxygenated circulation. And so that reduces the saturation of oxygen because this shunt, you don't have any gas exchange over here. There's no, um, op, it's not, it's depleted with oxygen. So if you mix a little bit of venous blood, that's the shunting with arterial blood, that's gonna cause the PO2 levels of oxygen to decrease. So instead of 100, it's now approximately 96 or so. Now let's look at the oxygen dissociation curve for hemoglobin. As you know, oxygen in the blood is transported bound to hemoglobin. And this shows the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen, right? So how effectively hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen? That's the uh, sigmoidal curve that we see over here. So at the lungs, in the alveoli, we know that the partial pressure of oxygen is approximately 100 millimeters of mercury. So you can see that uh, hemoglobin is completely saturated with oxygen. So we have, um, remember, four oxygen molecules binding to every ion atom, to every hemoglobin molecule. So here in the alveoli, we have four oxygen molecules bound to every hemoglobin molecule. However, in the tissues, the partial pressure of oxygen is much lower, typically around 20 to 40 or so. So that really means that uh, that's because the tissues constantly um, use up the oxygen and hence their partial pressures of oxygen is naturally going to be a lot lower than compared to in the alveoli in the lungs. But the important thing about this diagram is that it shows that the oxygen dissociation curve is for hemoglobin is steepest at the oxygen concentration that occurs in the tissue. So this will permit now at a point, let's just say 30 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in the tissue, that's a concentration partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues, you can see that uh, approximately f now the oxygen saturation levels is going to be, let's just use 40. Now the oxygen saturation level is going to be 75%. That means that one oxygen molecule is going to be dissociated. Because remember, 100% saturated, that means you have four oxygen molecules bind to hemoglobin. If it's 75% saturated, and now it means that we have three oxygen molecules bound to hemoglobin, which means that one has been let go. So there's really still a lot of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. At the tissues, only one oxygen out of four is let go from every hemoglobin molecule. But if the oxygen levels in the tissue drops further during, say, rigorous exercise, now hemoglobin, every hemoglobin molecule can let go of even more. So if the oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen decreases to 20, now you can see hemoglobin will be only 25% saturated. So instead of letting go of only one oxygen molecule, each hemoglobin molecule will let go of now three. It makes a big deal. So that we've increased oxygen unloading from hemoglobin from hemoglobin tremendously. So instead of one for every hemoglobin molecule that is typically let go of, now we have three being let go of. That's a 300% increase. That's huge. And so it works perfectly. What shifts the hemoglobin saturation curve? So let's, why would you first of all need to sh shift the curve? So let's look at it. So at a given oxygen saturation levels, we saw this is the normal oxygen saturation curve. 
this is a shifted curve. So let's just say at a normal oxygen saturation in the tissues of 40, as we saw approximately only over here, each hemoglobin molecule will now only want to be about 75% saturated, meaning each hemoglobin molecule will give up one oxygen molecule. However, if we shift the curve, now you can see at the same partial pressure, at the same partial pressure of 40, sorry, the curve is just behave, misbehaving, at the same partial pressure, when we shift the curve to the right, now the oxygen uh, hemoglobin only wants to be 50% saturated, so it will give up two oxygen molecules. Each hemoglobin molecule will give up two oxygen molecules. In other words, when we shift the curve to the right, we are decreasing the affinity of oxygen for hemoglobin, or rather, we are decreasing the the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. That's the right word, shift. Why should we decrease the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen? Well, this would make sense when the tissues are demanding more oxygen, right? When that would that occur? Well, I'd like for you to think about rigorous exercise. What happens during rigorous exercise? Obviously, during rigorous exercise, we need more oxygen. But what are the physiological changes that occur? Our body temperature rises. So it Increase in temperature will shift the oxygen saturation curve of hemoglobin to the right, thereby the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen will decrease at the typical physiological PO2 levels or partial pressure of oxygen levels in the tissues. Now uh, that, because the curve dips steeply over he here, uh, hemoglobin will give up more oxygen molecule because its affinity for oxygen has decreased. So increasing the temperature will shift the curve to the right. Increasing the acidity of blood will shift the curve to the right. Think again about the exercising muscle. So during rigorous exercise, we're producing lactic acid, for example. That's an acid that increases the acidity it means that the oxygen levels are too low. It means that the tissues need more oxygen, and so the curve will shift to the right. So increasing acidity will shift the curve to the right. The other way of stating it is that decreasing pH will shift the curve to the right as well. So that's the most important things. Increasing temperature will shift the curve to the right. Decreasing pH will shift the curve to the right, or increasing Acidity will shift the curve to the right. And finally, increasing carbon dioxide will also shift the curve to the right. But carbon dioxide, as we'll see in AMP2, is an acid, so it's really the same thing. But again, during an exercising muscle, during rigorous exercise, the muscles are producing lots of CO2, so it makes sense that they want more oxygen. It makes sense for the hemoglobin saturation curve to shift to the right. So how is oxygen transported? Most of the oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, but for CO2 it's different. For CO2, most of the CO2 is all it's transported in the form of bicarbonate, and we'll see how that operates. 30% of CO2 is bound to hemoglobin, but not to the iron part, to the globin chains, so the terminal uh, protein chains. And 10% of CO2 is directly dissolved just in plasma, so, and that's because CO2 is more soluble in plasma compared to oxygen. And so this is really how oxygen and CO2 and it's transported. So let me get my cursor. So over here we have, this is at the tissue level. So if we pretend uh, this is at the alveoli, oxygen will diffuse from the alveoli into the plasma where because it's not very soluble, it will diffuse further into the red blood cells to be bound to hemoglobin. And that's how 98% of hemoglobin is transported bound to hemoglobin. But now let's look at what happens at the tissue levels. At the tissue levels, naturally the heme oxygen needs to be dissociated from hemoglobin and then diffuse down its concentration gradient into the cells. But in order for oxygen to be released from the hemoglobin, something needs to occur. At the same time as oxygen is needed, you need to get rid of CO2. So CO2 diffuses from the cells into the plasma, where some of it is dissolved, 10%, the remaining will diffuse further into the red blood cell, where some of it will be bound to the globin chains of hemoglobin. But uh, most of it will first react with water in the presence of this enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase. Uh, 
Carbonic anhydrase will catalyze the reaction of CO2 in water to give you carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will dissociate to give you bicarbonate and acid, this proton over here. The bicarbonate will be pushed out of the red blood cell using this pump and chloride will be brought in. So that's called a chloride shift. So you need to maintain electrical neutrality. Bicarbonate is a negatively charged anion and chloride is negatively charged so if you're pushing out a negatively charged anion we need to bring in another anion so that's just a chloride shift over there so bicarbonate is ultimately transported in the plasma over there and chloride is brought in just to maintain the electrical neutrality so that's great we this is how co2 is transported in the form of bicarbonate but there's a problem what happens to the acid if you don't take care of the acid now the internal environment of the red blood cell is going to get more and more acidic so it, it turns out that this acid is actually not going to remain as an acid. This acid is actually picked up by oxyhemoglobin. So oxyhemoglobin is a, a stronger acid compared to deoxyhemoglobin. It's a stronger base compared to deoxyhemoglobin. And so it will pick up that proton. And when it picks up that proton, now hemoglobin will have a lesser affinity for oxygen. So uh, in the process of oxyhemoglobin picking up the proton, it becomes reduced. And at the same time, it reduces the affinity for oxygen. And so oxygen gets offloaded from the hemoglobin. Where's my little cursor again disappearing? Ugh, it's not coming back. Anyways, you can see the oxygen hemoglobin uh, dissociating when it's bound to the proton will dissociate the oxygen and now oxygen will be transported down remember this at the tissue down its concentration gradient into the cell where it's desperately needed now we'll end up with deoxyhemoglobin deoxyhemoglobin some of it will bind to co2 to form carb um, amino hemoglobin and the remaining will just um, be transported back to the lungs whereby it will avoid being oxygenated further. So in the, at the alveoli, the oxygen will diffuse from the alveoli to the deox into the red blood cells eventually, where it will bind with the deoxyhemoglobin and the cycle will continue. In the alveoli as well, carbon dioxide will come back into the red blood cell. It will, the reverse reaction will occur with carbonic anhydrase because the pressure gradient is different now. It, bicarbonate will bind to the proton. Where does the proton come from? The proton comes from the deoxyhemoglobin. So the deoxyhemoglobin will give up the proton. Now it will increase its affinity for, for oxygen. And so the deoxyhemoglobin will bind to oxygen forming oxyhemoglobin. The proton that is released will bind to bicarbonate. So this is the reverse reaction as uh, shown over here. The proton that is released from deoxyhemoglobin will bind to um, bicarbonate which will, is brought back into the red blood cell it will form a carbonic acid carbonic anhydrase will catalyze a reverse reaction to give you co2 and then co2 will diffuse out of the red blood cell into the alveoli and it will be excreted out so let's summarize gas exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange occurs at the blood gas interface within the lungs this exchange is enhanced by the large surface area of the interface and the fact that the barrier between the blood and the air is very thin. That's the blood brain barrier, which is made up of the endothelial cell, the type 1 pneumocytes typically, and their fused basement membrane, and that's approximately 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 micrometers. So it's very, very thin. Ventilation and perfusion ensure that the partial pressure gradients driving the diffusion of oxygen and CO2 across this barrier are kept high. The interface is perfused by blood from the pulmonary circulation, as you know. So the blood is brought to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries and ultimately the pulmonary capillaries. Pulmonary perfusion pressures are very low and these pulmonary capillaries have relatively thin walls. These features means that the pulmonary vessels readily expand and collapse in response to extravascular forces. So oxygen and CO2 exchange really does occur simply by simple diffusion. And it is driven by the partial pressure gradients for both gases. The diffusion of gases across the alveoli wall is influenced by the barrier thickness and the to total surface areas, both, both of which can become limiting in a diseased lung. So for example, the barrier thickness might be increased during um, chronic bronchitis as you get lots of secretion.
And so now instead of just 0 0.5 millimeters thick, the barrier being, it could be a lot thicker because of all the mucus over there, and that would impact a gas diffusion. And total surface areas could be impacted by, for example, COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease, or a variant of which is emphysema, and that would decrease total alveoli surface areas. And so we'll talk more about that in processes of human diseases in year two. So hence the net uptake of these gases, oxygen and CO2, or even the excretion, may be limited by inadequacy due to also due to perfusion. So we call that the perfusion limited exchange. Let's look at the actual diffusion in more detail. Oxygen has limited water solubility, so an oxygen binding protein, which is obviously hemoglobin, is required to help to transport it to the tissues in the quantities required for aerobic respiration. Oxygen binds to four sites on the hemoglobin, specifically the iron itself. So you, each ion can bind to four oxygen molecules, which means that each hemoglobin molecule binds to four oxygen molecules. The cooperative nature of the oxygen binding ensures that blood oxygen saturation occurs during passage through the lungs and facilitates oxygen release as the blood passes through the tissues that is served by the systemic circulation. So that's the sigmoidal curve that we saw, and that's because you get cooperative binding. Um, when one oxygen molecule binds to hemoglobin, it increases the affinity of hemoglobin for the next molecule, and that's how you get that assay curve. So the fourth oxygen molecule binds, um, has a greater affinity of binding to hemoglobin compared to that last one. And hence you need a steep pressure gradient in order to get hemoglobin to give up that first oxygen molecule after hemoglobin gives up the first oxygen molecule, it's easier to give up the subse subsequent ones because that's just the reverse, right? So it's cooperative binding. Each oxygen molecule binding to hemoglobin increases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. That's how you get that S-shaped curve. Uh, how, so most of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. That's the important thing. Very little is dissolved in blood, less than 1% or so. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is transported in dissolved form, 30%, 10% is dissolved, about approximately 30% is bound to hemoglobin as carbon amino hemoglobin, and it's bound to hemo the hemoglobin chains, sorry, but most of it, 60 to 70%, is transported in the form of bicarbonate, and bicarbonate is formed by the dissociation of carbonic acid, and you need CO2 will react with water to form carbonic acid. You need the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. That's why CO2 has to go into the red blood cell. Otherwise, it wouldn't need to. Carbonic anhydrase accelerates the reaction of CO2 and water by a billion fold. So you need that enzyme. Otherwise, it's very slow. And so that's why CO2 also, just like oxygen, has to first go into the red blood cell. And then once the bicarbonate is formed, it will come out of the red blood cell through the chloride shift over there. So that's in summary, so focus a little bit about the anatomy, but most important is the physiology, how oxygen is transported, how CO2 is transported as well. Hope this review, is, you find it to be useful. Have a great day, good luck on the test, thanks, bye.